Welcome colleagues to CGD's online event, the role of parliamentarians in strengthening COVID-19 response and recovery. My name is Calypso Chokyudu and I'm the director of uh, the Global Health Programme here at CGD and a senior fellow. Since the beginning of the outbreak, many have been sounding alarm over the true cost of the pandemic and how it may well end up being measured by its impact on health services within and beyond COVID. Today, working together with the Global Fund, we've organized an event, a discussion, to look at the role of parliamentarians in tackling COVID-19 and in assuring the health and well-being of citizens all over the world, especially as uh, policymakers are considering tough choices on resource allocation decisions, as these are specific to their own national health context. Many governments are arguably uh, reasonably centralizing decision making amidst the pandemic. Global development partners, the World Bank, others are fast tracking the release of flexible resources. At the same time, members of parliament are essential when it comes to ensuring accountability and oversight, more now than ever. The current pandemic may well intensify pressures on the principles of open government and oversight. However, the temptation of fast tracking through uh, expedited and perhaps opaque processes to avoid delays is a temptation to be perhaps avoided. Transparency of information and data participation are important, are essential for an effective response, which balances the COVID response with the wider social and health needs, which helps build sustainable health systems through the crisis and beyond the crisis. And most importantly, participation and oversight are not optional extras when it comes to building trust. And trust is in turn of the essence when it comes to individuals appropriately adapting their behaviors to the new normal brought about by the pandemic crisis. Areas such as procurement demonstrate the importance of process, of due process and transparency. Speed and efficiency go hand in hand with visibility in the public domain of what is being purchased, by whom and why. More broadly, transparency into funding flows, and we've written at CGD extensively about that, and the uses of those monies is critical to assuring the speed and cohesiveness of the pandemic response at global and national levels, especially because of the record amount of resources being mobilized. Today, we'll hear from members of parliament who are engaged in global, regional, and nationally, national parliamentary networks focused on global health, and to some extent also on the three diseases, TB, HIV, and malaria, and they'll tell us about the challenges presented by COVID-19 in their own communities and opportunities for increased effectiveness and accountability, perhaps, of the pandemic response efforts, as well as ways to sustain the provision of health, essential health services now and later. Beyond this event, we've been doing a lot of work here at CGD, looking at the impacts of the policy response on health, essential health services uh, beyond COVID, and we're trying to set up, pre prepare tools and share tools that can help uh, policymakers map out the indirect health effects at country and global levels. We have an open access inventory of uh, the impacts and we've produced also a net health impact calculator. Feel free to browse all of these resources on our website. Now, throughout today's event, viewers can submit questions through YouTube, on Twitter using the hashtag uh, CGD Talks or by emailing events at cgdev.org. With that, I'll pass first over to Scott Boulay, Senior Specialist of Parliamentary Affairs at the Global Fund to fight HIV, tuberculosis and malaria, to give us some additional remarks, help us frame uh, the conversation today in the context of the three diseases and beyond in the context of essential health services. Over to you, Scott. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, I want to start by thanking the Center for Global Development for convening uh, today's discussion. Uh, I want to thank very much Dr. Chakodu and Dr. Pai for leading us through this discussion. And I especially want to thank the members of Parliament who have taken time from their schedules to talk through um, uh, their experiences and, and give their insights. This question about how to best engage uh, with parliaments in the response to COVID is directly relevant to the Global Fund's mission. Uh, we allocate over $4 billion a year to fight infectious diseases. Uh, we're the largest international funder for the global TB response, as well as the global malaria response, and the second largest funder for the global HIV response. We're also the largest multilateral provider of grants for 
health system strengthening. And when we look at the modeling uh, that our key technical partners have done recently, technical partners like WHO, UNAIDS, Stop TB Partnership, the findings are sobering. Um, they are finding that if uh, we experience prolonged and significant disruptions in service delivery, we could see progress uh, in terms of caseloads and in terms of death rates. Um, we could see progress uh, uh, set back by over a decade in terms of HIV and TB. And for malaria, it could be nearly uh, two decades. Uh, similarly, we have been conducting surveys uh, of the programs that the Global Fund finances in over 100 countries around the world. And uh, about three quarters of them have reported disruptions to service delivery, with about 20% reporting high or very high disruptions. So at the Global Fund, we've got about 20 years of experience fighting infectious diseases. And we believe we've developed a, a set of uh, core cap capabilities uh, that we have a responsibility to leverage in the response to COVID. Um, capabilities like engaging with communities and civil society, um, working through local supply chains, uh, working in partnership, not only with communities and civil society, but also governments and the private sector, uh, and procuring high quality health products um, at a fair price at scale. These are the, the kinds of investments that are gonna need to be scaled up dramatically over the course of the next 12 months. And um, we have been working with partners to calculate uh, what the needs are gonna be to have a robust, uh, uh, impactful response to COVID over the next 12 months. And the estimates are a total need in the countries that are most impacted by HIV, TB, and malaria of uh, uh, $28.5 billion. Um, from the Global Fund perspective, uh, if we were to play a role that's commensurate with the role we're currently playing in HIV, TB, and malaria, uh, what we would need over the next 12 months is uh, about $6 billion. We've already set aside through various mechanisms a billion dollars that's going out and, and went out quickly uh, to countries to combat COVID and to adapt their HIV, TB, and malaria programs. Uh, so our remaining need is $5 billion over the next 12 months. That's the amount we believe that we could allocate uh, effectively and efficiently to have a real meaningful impact um, against COVID working with partners. So um, that's something we're going to be talking with partners about a lot in the coming months. And um, I, I really appreciate having the opportunity to uh, listen to this discussion and get insights from the parliamentarians, not only about the work that they're doing, but uh, the messages uh, uh, that are most impactful uh, when engaging with parliaments and the information that they need when they're making decisions about uh, their COVID response and their COVID investments. So thanks again to all of the participants and back to you, Dr. Chakadu. Thank you, thank you, um, Scott. Um, so I will now introduce to you our four uh, members of parliament, honorable members of parliament who are kindly taken the time out of their busy schedules to join us today. Um, I will put to them one broad question and ask them each to comment. I will call on each one of them to comment before then passing on to uh, Professor Madupai uh, to moderate the discussion. But let me start with introducing uh, our four uh, members of parliament. Just to say we had a fifth member invited from uh, Uzbekistan, but sadly uh, she's had issues. Uh, she, was, she and her family have been directed, directly affected by COVID. We wish her the best. Uh, to her and her loved ones and this demonstrates how we're all very much uh, vulnerable to to the current crisis um okay let me start first with honorable stephen mutinta mule who is a member of parliament of kenya he's a member of the health committee and the parliamentary human rights caucus and a co-chair of the african tb caucus and the kenyan tb caucus it's wonderful to have you uh, honorable vincent pala member of parliament of india and the global coalition against tb Again, welcome. Honorable Abu Bakar Dahiru Serki, member of the National Assembly of Nigeria, chair of the HIV, Tuberculosis and Malaria Control Committee, and member, member of the Ad Hoc Committee on the COVID-19 response. Welcome. And finally, Honorable Gisela Scaglia, member of Parliament of Argentina and the co-chair of the Americas TB Caucus. So uh, very much honored to have you all. I would like to ask you to spend a few minutes, ideally no more than three minutes, so we have more time uh, for further discussions amongst the panel and then 
also to address the questions of the people who are uh, listening to us. I would like you to please share some examples of perhaps one key achievement and one persistent difficulty of the COVID-19 response efforts in your country, highlighting how your country's government is considering the broader health and social consequences of COVID-19 policies. So one achievement, what you think you're proud of and you'd like to share with us, and then a persistent challenge that's uh, negatively affecting your efforts, the efforts of your country to uh, respond to the pandemic. I would like to start with Honorable Stephen Mutinta Muller of Kenya. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Caspo, uh, uh, for the invite and the introduction. I want to say that uh, Kenya, we have, we, have, we have achieved one major milestone uh, on the fight against COVID-19. Because of the measures which were taken initially by the government and the executive, to make sure that we have a lockdown on so-called hotspots. And I can assure you that uh, they have worked them tremendously. And also, the Ministry of Health through Senator Mutai Kakwe, who is the CS uh, uh, Ministry of Health, and the team uh, in the ministry have put up elaborate uh, measures to make sure that the fight against uh, COVID-19 uh, the emerging diseases or the other existing diseases. So, and one of the biggest challenges is we have had uh, a daily briefing to the nation through the media, the local media, the radio, the social media, for Kenyans to understand the effect of COVID-19. The most uh, challenging uh, issue we are facing is uh, uh, when COVID came in, initially was the issue of supply of commodities uh, to deal with uh, COVID-19 and other, the other diseases. And this is a challenge whereby we, we persistently try to overcome through the uh, innovative motive, uh, innovative uh, uh, procurement procedures which have been put in place by Kenya Medical Supplies Agency, this KEMSA. And we want to thank them because they have made sure that at least they have enough stocks for the country to make sure that they are able to contain any quick supplies required by both the national government and the county government. I want to say that uh, recently the, ex the His Excellency uh, President Kenyatta made the announcement of opening up the country and opening up the economy and uh, passing the battle of the challenge of COVID-19. And that is working out very well because Kenyans know that they are, it is their own responsibility to make sure that they keep, uh, uh, they keep themselves. The other challenge is regarding the other diseases like HIV, uh, TB, malaria. Uh, we had some stockouts of uh, uh, malaria kits, but uh, as far this week have been updated and moved to the country. Uh, for tuberculosis, we have a few gaps which the ministry is trying to uh, cover using uh, the UHC uh, funding from the government. And for HIV, uh, the ministry and the department uh, of, uh, of HIV has come up with the guidelines to deal with the issues of all the patients uh, regarding uh, that. So, uh, so far, so good in Kenya. Uh, this uh, COVID is real. This afternoon, the minister has just announced a new 491 cases uh, uh, from the which were tested Last but not least is that uh, we are still uh, looking forward to see how best we can integrate the rapid testing on COVID. Thank you. Um, we've had some sound issues um, and message. I think um, the image perhaps have under has undermined the sound quality. So we'll try and resolve this, but takeaways, a timely response on behalf of the Kenyan government, 
uh, good regular communication, challenges, procurement, commodities, uh, stock outs, and again, an ongoing continuous effort to address uh, this challenge, um, working with KEMSA, the Kenyan procurement agency. I will move on to Honorable Vincent Pala from India. Over to you, one challenge, one success, please. Thank you, and uh, uh, good morning or good evening to everybody wherever you are. Uh, I want to begin by thanking the Global Center for Development, the Global Fund, and the Global TV Kakas for giving me this opportunity, and to all the panelists here for taking the time to discuss these critical issues. The COVID-19 pandemic has gripped the world. In India, on 24th of March, the central government of India has announced the lockdown to curtail the spread of COVID. As we begin to unlock and open up, India has the third largest, highest number of cases in the world with over nine, like means 9,000, uh, I think 900,000 cases being reported. We have some positive information to report. Though the case fatality rate has remained consistently low and recovery rate has improved to almost 60%. However, if I look at the challenges as mentioned across studies and commentaries, low test rates has been a matter of concern. Testing capacity has increased in recent weeks. Over 1,000 laboratories with daily testing capacity of more than three lakhs, that is 300,000 samples, but testing rates are still low. According to data available, I think India is, has 4,100 people tested per million compared with the global average of 29,000 per million. The pandemic and the lockdown also severely impact the livelihood of millions of people, especially the daily wage laborers and migrant workers, as has happened to other countries. Other health services are, were also severely impacted, such as the TB, detention of, uh, I mean, the detection of uh, treatment, immunization and routine nutrition services. We have like a meal, a midday meals, the Anganwadi care. Even the data is on the recently launched health insurance scheme, weekly claims volume for the last 10 weeks of lockdown was half the pre lockdown claims volume. I would like also to briefly like to mention the role played by our multiple stakeholders, including my friends in the parliament, in addressing the impact of COVID and lockdown on health services. My colleagues in parliament and me have been working closely with our district administrations. What we do, we call the district administrations to ensure that affordable access to quality health services for those who are in need. We recognize that there is a need for more localized review and monitoring practices, especially in the situation. This gives us an opportunity to identify area specific challenges and tailor our response accordingly. I will uh, deal more this is my remarks. Thank you very much. And uh, thank, thank you for the organizers for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, so a low fatality rate, thankfully, so far. Um, however, challenges with scaling up testing um, uh, and adverse impact on the poorest, perhaps with specific disease impact also, including on TB and new TB uh, notifications. We will discuss this further uh, after the opening remarks. I would like to ask now Honorable Abu Bakar Dahiru Serki of Nigeria uh, for his opening remarks, a challenge um, and a success. Over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, good day all. I want to thank uh, the organizers of this program for such a great initiative and for featuring me on this platform. The COVID-19 pandemic has really impacted our lives. Our system disrupted many process, plan and development, but have also presented us the opportunity to right many wrongs. So far, the National Assembly of Nigeria, through its tuberculosis and malaria control committee and other health-related committees is doing everything possible through legislative means to ensure that the country responds to the, to the pandemic adequately. 
In March 2020, the 360 members of the House of Representatives, including myself, in fact, we have donated 100% of our two month salary to the National Relief Fund account for the fight against COVID-19 pandemic towards alleviating the hardship that their constituents will face during the national emergency and to improve the living conditions of the citizens in their various constituencies. The Senate has also committed uh, to contribute 50% uh, of their salaries to the, to, to the efforts geared towards responding to the spread and treatment of coronavirus cases in the country until the country is declared free from the virus. I must say that uh, since the emergence of the pandemic, the health care systems and service have been drastically affected. There has been a massive decline in routine immunization and also a drop in TB cases notification, as well as a drop in clinical attendance by the patients. This can be attributed to stigma, uh, misinformation, rumors, fake news, and also a lot of confusion as a result of the similarities in the symptom of COVID-19, tuberculosis, HIV, and malaria. Uh, sadly, most of the mortality recorded has been among people living with uh, uh, comorbidities of which uh, TB is one of them. According to the information from the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19, uh, people, uh, people with health challenges such as hypertension, diabetes, kidney cases, HIV, cancer, and tuberculosis have accounted for 70% of COVID-19 deaths in Nigeria. There is need for more sensitization on COVID-19, its, its relationship with other infectious diseases, preventive measures, stigmatization and discrimination, uh, proper use of PP, PPE, how to properly dispose PPEs after, uh, after use. The lockdown measures that was put in place by the government due to the pandemic has also failed an increase in the poverty level, despite government efforts to provide citizens with palliatives. This has made adherence to strict preventive measures really difficult as most people have to struggle for survival. Consequently, this is foiling the spread of the disease amongst Nigerians, especially at the community level. Also, world, uh, also to mention, the federal government of Nigeria, with the help of donors and multi-sectoral resources mobilization and external partners support, has strengthened some of the health facilities. They have built isolation centers, build the capacity of health workers, and also provide the poorest of citizens with palliatives. Also, uh, also to mention, the federal government of Nigeria with the, uh, with the help of the multi-sectoral resources mobilization and external personal support has strengthened some of the health facilities by also building some isolation center. Without doubt, additional external resources and expertise will also help to strengthen the country's response in terms of information best practices, research and development in the fight against novel virus. Up to, up to today, our parliaments have not opted up completely and our sittings is just once uh, presently in a week. Uh, I look forward to a very fruitful uh, discussion to, uh, today and also I want to thank the Global TV Caucus for organizing this very important forum for us. Thank, thank you. you and God bless. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is insightful and important. And lastly, I'd like to ask Honorable Gisela Scaglia, Member of Parliament of Argentina and the co-chair of the Americas TV Caucus for her remarks, please. Uh, an achievement and a persistent challenge. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, in this moment of adversity, it seems that the only relief we can find is the well-known phrase, these two shall pass. However, COVID-19 pandemic teaches us that if we don't promote true change at global level, 
This will not only be the world we are leaving to our children, but also the one in which we will live ourselves. We are risking our future. The future comes faster and much more chaotic than we could have imagined, and we did not live up to the circumstances. This cannot happen again. We must learn from the impact of infection diseases that we already knew, such as tuberculosis, HIV, AIDS, or malaria, both in our communities and in our economies. And from that learning, commit ourselves to work towards the prevention of old and new diseases. Recent studies show that the restrictions taken by most of our governments in order to contain the spread of COVID-19 will have an impact on the TB response, leading to an additional 6.3 million cases of TB and 1.4 million additional deaths between 2020 and 2025. In Argentina, we know that the resources relocated to the diagnostic and treatment of people affected by COVID-19 today are generating a global decrease in the purchase of medicines to cure TB or treat people with HIV AIDS. Budget and health personnel to respond to these two diseases are redirected to COVID-19. These are just simple examples of the negative and invisible consequences of the pandemic in our health systems. The post-pandemic crisis and budgetary adjustment to address COVID-19 are likely to further affect the budget for TB and HIV AIDS and lead to the AIDS in clinical trials of new drugs, diagnostic, and vaccines. International donation and international cooperation for these diseases are also expected to be reduced. We know that 2020 is not just another year. And although it's too early to draw definitive conclusions, we are certain that our, that our perception about the strength or weakness of our health systems has changed globally. The current pandemic highlights the need to develop better systems with universal health coverage and the importance of financing vaccines, treatment, and diagnostic with public research. And what can parliamentarians do? We have to commit to this as a generation. We have to use our power to work to sustain and increase the resources available for TB, HIV, and AIDS. We have to push our governments to invest more in health, not just a healthy strategy, but as an economic response. We have to build coalitions to ensure that health is not a game of zero gain. Investing in health is investing in our future. Investing on the TB epidemic is investing in stronger health outcomes. It has never been clear that this is the time to invest in research and development. As a member of the Global TV Caucus and the co-chair of the Americas TV Caucus, I'm committed to investing in strategies to address these and future pandemics, putting TB in the center of this response. The challenge is great. The time is now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And hopefully we'll be able to go more into specifics uh, in the next section of our, of our discussion. I appreciate uh, your, your comments. What I would like to do now is introduce to you my co-chair or co-moderator, Dr. Ma Dr. Maduka Pai. Uh, Dr. Pai is the Canada Research Chair of Epidemiology and Global Health, uh, Director of Global Health and Director of the International TB Center at McGill University. And I'm very grateful to him uh, for joining us and for accepting to moderate uh, the discussion and the audience Q&A right after. Uh, as a reminder, please uh, do send us your questions. We are collecting questions via YouTube, via Twitter at uh, CGDev, and also via email events at cgdev.org. Um, so I will pass on now to, uh, to Madhu for um, his kind help in moderating the conversation and getting us to some uh, specifics. Over to you, Madhu. May I ask uh, colleagues uh, if there's problems with um, uh, bandwidth? Uh, feel free to switch off your video. Unfortunately, that's the only thing we can do. Uh, so if you're feeling, if your voice is breaking and it's not clear, please do switch off the video so we can hear you. I think that's the most important thing. Over to you, uh, Madhu. Um, thank you, Calypso. And I'm um, really grateful to all our um, parliamentarians for taking their time off 
we know how difficult and stressful this time is for uh, everyone. So we really appreciate that. And secondly, I am personally delighted that uh, MPs like you care about TB, AIDS and malaria. Um, because for those of us, uh, I work in TB for many, many years and we've been losing 1.5 million people every year to TB year after year after year. And we never saw anyone take TB seriously the way COVID is being taken seriously um, by country governments. And we always wonder why is it that um, killers like TB never really found any uh, political will. So it's absolutely amazing that MPs like you care about diseases like TB, AIDS and malaria. So as uh, Scott outlined and as some of the parliamentarians also uh, reiterated, this pandemic is devastating uh, for all aspects of global health, particularly TB, AIDS and malaria are very vulnerable in, in this stage. Um, so we already know dramatic declines in TB case notifications everywhere. Um, that means people are simply not being diagnosed and they are at home um, with disease and they're not getting treatment. And we will have thousands of people backlogged waiting to be picked up and put back on treatment. We know malaria mortality is likely to double in Sub-Saharan Africa this year alone. And if we don't get antiretrovirals to people living with HIV, we're gonna see at least half a million more uh, HIV related deaths in the coming year. I mean, this is devastating. And to say, see that we have lost five to 10 years of progress very hard work done by millions of people around the world is heartbreaking really. And um, especially for me working in TB, I'm just absolutely devastated by what, um, what is happening in TB alone. And I know people feel the same way in other areas. So the big question is, how can we fight COVID and simultaneously not drop the ball on these absolutely critical priority diseases? Um, it is not either this or that, we know that because we simply cannot not deal with COVID, right? People are falling sick. We must do something about COVID. At the same time, if we completely stop vaccinating kids, we completely stop supplying ARVs to people living with HIV, the total devastation will be beyond uh, anything that we can imagine. So one big overarching question to all of you as MPs is how can you advocate with your leaders to make sure essential TB, HIV, malaria, immunization, contraception, and those services are resumed, even if it is not possible to do it through the regular public system that is very overwhelmed with COVID, can be engaged with private health services and NGOs and volunteers and community health workers, anyone and everyone can be contributing in this crisis to bring back those essential health services so that we are not completely abandoning uh, people in need with other uh, conditions. Um, the second overarching issue that I'm particularly um, worried about, I chair the uh, public-private uh, mixed partnership uh, within the Stop TB partnerships working groups, and private health services is, is completely kind of gone missing in this crisis. In many countries, including yours, we know India has an extremely large private health sector, so does Kenya, so does Nigeria. So what is happening to the private health sector? And if they've either disappeared, contracted, or become extraordinarily expensive, what happens to all the millions of people who are depending on private health sector when the public sector is still dealing with massive amounts of people with COVID and is already underfunded and weak? So to me, this critical issue for all of us is there's a surge in the need for healthcare, both for COVID and non-COVID. And yet the public system is completely overwhelmed with COVID and private sector is either contracted, disappeared, or has become very uh, inaccessible or unaffordable, which puts an average person in this extremely bad position that they don't want to go to public because public is full of people with COVID, they're scared of getting it, and they don't cannot go to private because private is either saying no to them or private is charging a lot of money for them, and they are completely stuck between two really difficult options, which makes it uh, impossible to deal with any of these uh, health issues. So my first question is um, for our Honorable Stephen uh, Mule, if he's on the line. Um, and we know uh, Kenya uh, has an extremely high rate of HIV, and we know um, uh, antiretroviral supplies are dwindling. In fact, there was a report by uh, the UNAIDS um, just recently, uh, as well as WHO and partners expressing the anxiety about supply of essential antiretroviral medicines. So what exactly is Kenya's plan 
to uh, continuously supply ARVs to the thousands of Kenyans uh, who currently need it. Thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, what we have done as the Committee of Health is to make sure that the, the, there is enough funding for HIV, uh, malaria, and TB, uh, both uh, local, uh, local domestic resources and also the international uh, uh, donor funding through local fund, the World Bank, and the other parties. Uh, immediately after the COVID came on board, around uh, uh, April, May in Kenya, the HIV department, the malaria department, and the immunization uh, department uh, had been asked to, uh, to put up guidelines uh, for the country and especially on the HIV because we are still one of the countries with high burden. And some of the guidelines which were put in place uh, were First, to make sure that all facilities within the Kenyan uh, uh, government have enough thermometers to make sure that they test uh, the, the temperatures for these patients. Uh, the other uh, issue was the issue of HIV testing and case of identification of the HIV patient and also to identify uh, uh, the new cases. The other issue was to put up a very elaborate mechanism to make sure that the RT care continues in all the clinics across the country and treatment. And we have gone further to make sure that uh, the support uh, continue of treat, uh, treatment of the healthcare is done at the community level uh, for the HIV because we want to make sure that every Kenyan is responsible. And that's what the president said the other day. Then we also announced the laboratory service. Uh, we, are, we are sort of decentralized to most of the counties that, uh, to deal with the issues of pregnant women, uh, breastfeeding mothers, uh, uh, new diagnosis of HIV must be identified and dealt with immediately. Early infant diagnostics is also key for us as a country. We have also uh, given a directive or the guideline we given was that uh, commodities management for antiviral drugs, test kits, uh, TB drugs, malaria drugs are reported back to the national government with uh, 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 every on, uh, on tenth of every month we get reports of how the stocks levels are at the county level to make sure that they are, uh, they are, they are able to be uh, serviced immediately. Uh, the other issue which have been put in place uh, by the government and the, uh, uh, the committee of health we are looking forward to make sure that it is working is that is to trace down all the commodities to the end users. And that is being done using Cambridge technology and uh, reporting back to make sure that at least we don't let COVID overrun these diseases and make sure that at least every uh, health center, dispensary, and the level four, level three, level five hospitals have enough kits. The biggest problem, as I said in the beginning, is the challenge of supplies uh, uh, globally because uh, COVID has brought a lot of issues on uh, issues of transport and whatever. But I want to thank KEMSA. They are doing a fantastic job, new innovation of procuring, new innovation of engaging uh, uh, suppliers, new ways of uh, uh, making sure that commodities get to the, uh, uh, the far end rich areas in the country uh, through air, and they are, they are moving well. Thank you very much. So, so, Mr. Mule, just a quick follow-up question. So, uh, your supply of antiretrovirals, for example, um, is it manufactured in Kenya or are you reliant on uh, imports from other countries like India? Uh, we have supplies which are man uh, supplies of drugs which are manufactured in Kenya, and we also uh, rely on supplies which come from overseas. So that uh, gives us the synergy on how to make sure that, and that's why I'm saying KEMS has become very anti during this time because of innovation and encouraging local manufacturers to see where they can fill the gap when we have delays of 
uh, imports because of the challenge of COVID. Thank you. Um, this actually uh, leads uh, me uh, to a very important question for uh, Mr. Pala. Um, thank you again, Mr. Pala. You and I are both part of the Global uh, TB um, Coalition in India. Um, so as you know, undoubtedly, Mr. Pala, India has its own massive TB problem internally, and we know TB notifications have dropped, as you mentioned, and we know we have thousands of Indians that we have missed with TB that we need to find and treat. But India also has this enormous responsibility, uh, obligation, if you wish, to supply the whole world for TB medicines, uh, because India is the biggest generics manufacturer, right? And we also supply antiretrovirals to the rest of the world. India is the biggest supplier of malaria RDTs to the rest of the world. So, and we know lockdowns have disrupted many pharma industries, companies in India. I just read a note yesterday that Lupin had to shut down a whole factory because of COVID cases among factory workers. We know drug supply, I mean, uh, raw, raw materials from China are not necessarily coming into India. So everybody in the world is very nervous about India not resuming production of medicines for TB, AIDS and malaria, and how this can have a global ripple effect that can be disastrous for many countries. So what is it that you can do um, and what is it that you're already doing or planning to do to make sure India resumes production and supplies the whole world and India with essential medicines like TB, AIDS and, and malaria? Over to you. So Dr. Pai, I think, uh, I, I think you know more than me in terms of uh, India, but uh, uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, uh, definitely, uh, I think a very relevant uh, question. See, uh, I understand the manufacturing itself was uh, halted initially during the lockdown due to lack of human resources and travel restrictions, as well as a sense of fear. I believe the secretary uh, at the health ministry had written a letter expressing the concern of anti-TB drugs manufacturers who produce first-line anti-TB drugs. The letter said that uh, under the lockdown situation and due to availability of limited manpower and materials, API, uh, to the pharmaceutical industry, the production capacity of the leading anti-TB drug manufacturers of India has been uh, and definitely has been uh, affected. Uh, unfortunately, the situation remains grim. Uh, despite the lockdown lifting, the recent trade standoff between uh, India and China has resulted in shipments of uh, uh, API or uh, raw materials for drugs and key starting materials that go into making API being stuck at various ports of the country. This has of course impacted the sector. Over 60%, 63% uh, of India's pharmaceutical import are API and intermediates and almost 70% it comes from China. I think uh, you know that. Though we are the uh, largest manufacturers of the uh, medicines in the world and uh, but uh, as I understand, India is considering importing certain APIs and intermediaries from alternative sources, uh, such as the United States, Italy, Singapore, and Hong Kong. The government has also rolled out a 1.3 billion production link incentive uh, PLI scheme to boost the production of 41 bulk drugs ranging from antibiotics to ingredients for the life-saving drugs. I believe that it is the appropriate approach to find alternative sources for immediate use and develop domestic capac uh, capacities for in the long term. My colleague and I still believe that more can be done to provide uh, additional incentive to strengthen the domestic uh, capacity in terms of varying the cost utility like power, water, steam, and finance. And land cost is also a matter of uh, concern. But um, I'm sure in the coming days, India is thinking very seriously on these issues. And uh, in partnership with the US and the rest of the world, we are quite advanced in terms of medicine. I'm sure we'll overcome this. And uh, under your guidance, uh, I like you have, uh, through the committees, you are given lots of uh, uh, guidance, lots of, uh, the, we have, do follow the SOPs, we do follow the uh, WHO's uh, guidelines. I am sure that we'll be able to overcome it. 
Thank you, Dr. Pai. Thank you, Mr. Pala. I think this is an enormous contribution India can make to the whole world at this point, given the rising anxieties about all essential medicines getting stocked out if India does not resume production. And the tension with China is really unfortunate in its timing because if the raw materials from China don't come into India, we have an added layer of concern about drug supply. Um, maybe this is the kind of a thing that as an MP, um, you could uh, raise a question in the parliament um, asking what is the national strategy, both to resume production of essential medicines for Indians who need it, but also for the rest of the world that is heavily, heavily relying on India in this crisis. Um, my next question is to um, Honorable MP, uh, Mr. Sarkey uh, in Nigeria. Uh, so, um, um, sir, uh, everybody knows, just like India, Nigeria has a very, very large private health sector, and we know uh, the lockdowns have hit the private health sector very, very hard. Uh, many of them have completely shut down their small clinics and hospitals. Private GPs are very scared to, to practice medicine for the fear of getting COVID themselves. We know bigger hospitals have become very exploitative in many places. They're charging outrageous amounts of money to treat COVID. They don't want to treat COVID patients. They're turning them away. So the entire private health sector is kind of uh, in a crisis, uh, changed its character, some, some for the good, some for the bad. But there is a lot of anxiety globally that highly privatized countries will now struggle a lot because the public is really dealing with COVID as it is. And it has become the place for COVID patients to go then what happens to all the non-COVID patients? Where do they go if the private health sector is unaffordable or inaccessible in this crisis? So the question to you is, given Nigeria's large private health sector, how have you engaged that large private health sector to help you deal with this surge of patients, both COVID and non-COVID, for COVID testing, for TB testing, and so on and so forth? And how are you regulating that sector to make sure they're doing the right thing they're not indulging in exploitative practices that really puts patients at a disadvantage. Thank you. Mr. Sarki, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Yes, Thank sir. you. So, uh, actually, uh, the Nigerian uh, private sector leaders have come together to create the coalition against coronavirus. The conglomeration is made up of the captains of industries in the private sectors, the chief executives of the banks, oil and uh, gas and oil and others who have formed a strong alliance to support the government efforts in the fight against COVID-19. Uh, by providing technical and operational support to mobilize the private creation, public awareness, directing support to private and public healthcare institutions, building of fully equipped medical tents as testing isolations, treatment and training centers across the, uh, across the country. Uh, also, with regard to private uh, health sector collaboration with government, some private facilities have assisted government effort by donating their facilities and isolation uh, uh, centers for COVID-19, uh, shouldering the burden of uh, the burden of taking care of patients with other types of non-communicable -commun diseases like malaria, typhoid, uh, from government facilities that have been turned to isolation centers for COVID, and um, also some of the facilities uh, have also had. Uh, and services like uh, immunization, uh, especially in places where doctors went on strike action, the private health sector have also come together to contribute uh, ventilators, uh, personal protective equipment to hospitals. Uh, some have also uh, volunteered their staffs and medical personnel uh, to, to be trained along with government health uh, care, uh, uh, care uh, workers on COVID-19 preparedness and also uh, response. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, and the, the last question in this round is uh, for our MP from Argentina. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for your passionate uh, opening remarks. 
It's great to see you as a co-chair of the America TV Caucus. Um, so all of us are nervously watching the COVID epidemic take off in Latin America when it was rather quiet in the, in the past. And now Brazil in particular, Peru, uh, very um, worrisome. And Brazil and Peru in particular have big TB uh, burden as well. So how do you, um, as a Latin American co-chair of the TB Caucus, how do you see um, uh, getting back on track in terms of management of essential services for TB, AIDS, and malaria um, in, in, the, in the Latin American continent. And, and in Argentina, what's your biggest anxiety? What are you worried about as the, in terms of your uh, resuming essential services? Well, uh, we are very worried about our economies too. And we think that our economies have consequences in the health care and it's very important to to talk about uh, both economies and health care and as I have mentioned in my opening remarks uh, the impact of COVID-19 uh, it's frightening not only for Argentina but also for the world and in Latin America it's so special because our economies are weakness uh, but I think that uh, it's a great opportunity to, to rebuild our health systems and especially considering the expected budgetary austerity uh, measures uh, in post-pandemic recession. Um, we need to learn uh, about this tragedy and find the means to invest in our health system. This is so important and we have, we have to learn from other infection epidemics and uh, we have to know that health is not seen only from single perspective, but only uh, also multi multidisciplinary one. Um, we here in Argentina um, we have a mixed system of healthcare. We have private sector and public sector, and we are working together. Uh, we have we are working. Um, uh, all of us uh, in in try to 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 have the best system for from the Argentina and um, we think that now it's important the participation of interministerial uh, response and we think that we need the parliamentarians, academia, civil society now. And then uh, we are expecting the vaccine because it's very important this for our countries and from Latin America. Uh, and then when we have the vaccine, I think that we have to push uh, our equitable health systems because we have to, to give vaccines to all the people, not only for one sector, and I think that it's most important. So um, I think that it's very important in our countries, the economy, the health system, and the universal health care. I, I think that they, they are the, the three parts of these uh, topics and in this pandemic are very important. And we have to learn about TB, HIV, because they they have a lot of lessons uh, for us. Thank you. Gracias. Um, Calypso, would you like to uh, ask any of the audience QA now? Um, I think we should go straight to the audience QA. Please, Madhu, uh, go ahead and I can wrap up. Yes. Uh, so maybe one important question um, that uh, Madam Scaglia uh, sort of hinted is that um, um, everybody is uh, nervously watching this whole race to get a vaccine for COVID. And let's say the vaccine is developed in America or the UK or wherever, what would be the strategy for making it available and affordable in Sub-Saharan Africa, in India, in Latin America? Um, how are each of you thinking about um, access strategy for COVID vaccines? And are you doing any locally uh, relevant national R&D to develop your own vaccine or your own vaccine manufacturing so that you are not reliant on, on uh, you know, charitable donations of vaccines that may or may not come um, uh, next year? So how are you thinking about 
um, a strategy for your own country to make sure you have access to vaccines. Uh, shall we begin with uh, uh, Mr. Pala? Um, I know India has a couple of vaccine candidates, domestic vaccine candidates, and India has a track record of indigenous uh, rotavirus vaccine, uh, which is very inspiring to see. And India has the capacity to develop um, locally R&D products. So tell us about how India is approaching the, the vaccine issue. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Pai. Uh, actually, you already said that, uh, you know, the uh, Prime Minister of India has announced that by 15th of August, the uh, uh, producer of medicines must finish all formalities. Today itself, I read in the news that the, uh, the uh, ICMR, the authority for giving uh, all the certificates uh, to test the medicines. I think more than one companies in India have started the production of medicines and uh, ICMR has uh, already done a lot of work in this issue. I hope that the government of India is working uh, over time to see that India in collaboration with other uh, companies uh, outside India can uh, produce the medicine because India is number three now in terms of affection. I think very soon will be number two, will overtake Brazil. So common is thinking very seriously on this issue. I'm very confident since they have started the testing I think they have uh, approved for testing of 1,000 volunteers for the medicine. So I hope the medicine, the practice will take a month or two. So I'm very sure that India will be one of the front runner in producing our medicines and it has the capacity to produce it. And the government of India has uh, already authorized, I think, uh, like I said, more than uh, one companies who are doing the job. So I'm very confident we'll be having an indigenous medicines on this issue and hopefully we'll be able to help the rest of the world. But first of all, like I always say in terms of TV, if India can solve its problem, that half of the problems in the world are solved. So uh, I, I think we do need the, uh, uh, the help of other countries to get other API so that we can produce our own medicines. I'm very confident we'll be able to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pala. Let's hope an Indian COVID vaccine uh, will be effective so that India can uh, supply the rest of the world as it does with many other essential medicines and vaccines. Um, Honorable Skaglia, so you mentioned, um, you know, given the massive uh, increase in COVID in Latin America, is there any Latin American uh, strategy or within some of the Latin American countries to develop a local vaccine for COVID? If not, how would you see uh, getting access to a COVID vaccine next year, for example? Well, uh, I'm going to talk about Argentina, but I think that in Argentina we will be able, will we be able to think uh, of it as a public policy, because um, this must be part of the immunization schedule. And it must be public delivery. Uh, we don't, we cannot think about private sector and public sector. We have to think as a public delivery. And hopefully, uh, we can have the possibility of produce this vaccine, but uh, in our laboratories. And I think that could be an opportunity to our countries to to produce this because it's a way to generate new job or job resources. Uh, I think that it could be a possibility to, to our countries to have not only one laboratory in the world, uh, probably I think that we, ca we can have the opportunity to produce this in our countries. And I think that the most important in this moment is to have a public delivery uh, because uh, not all the population have the chance to buy some kind of vaccine. So we have to, to think about this and we have to put this in our budget. Thank you. Um, um, there are many, many more questions. So maybe I'll move on to um, uh, Mr. Sarki and ask him a different question. Um, <clears throat> how is Nigeria dealing with the civil society and your NGO community, which I know you have, you're a very active civil society. Um, in, are you um, um, harnessing them 
to do some of the uh, surveillance work or reaching patients in this crisis? How, how exactly are you dealing with civil society to in your COVID response? Mr. Sarki, I think you're muted. Uh, actually, we've been working hand in hand with the uh, civil society uh, so that uh, so that uh, at least we could be able to see how we could be able to synthesize our people. And uh, one of our responsibility as the uh, parliamentaries uh, from the grassroots into the, uh, especially from the primary healthcare into the grassroots because that is where the problem actually, uh, that is where we're having the problem because down the ladder, there is no uh, standardization. But with the civil so uh, society, in fact, uh, just uh, two days back, we hold a forum, we hold a meeting with them, especially pertaining all the civil society uh, from all over the nation. And uh, those are the type of things that uh, we try to brief them, especially with the Minister for Health. We try to uh, encourage them, mobilize them, so that at least everybody should go back to his various states. We have 36 states in the Federation, so that they could be able to go back to their states, so that uh, they could be able to synthesize their people, and uh, so that they could be able to tell them the importance of these things. Because up to now, from the rural areas, some people still believe as if uh, COVID is not even existing. And then so that we could be able to show them some of the pictures of people that are affected. And then um, believe me sincerely, uh, with the issue of the sensitization and collaboration of the civil society, we have already achieved almost 90, 90%. Thank you. And we're doing well. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And um, um, Honorable Mr. Mule, so um, uh, one question that you might be able to answer is, how would you describe um, the, the role of uh, parliamentarians um, in, this, uh, in this crisis? Um, and have you learned anything from observing um, other pa parliamentarians um, and, uh, in other countries or other regions in how they're responding to the COVID crisis? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, one one issue is that uh, we have learned from COVID, and uh, we expect the role of parliamentarians to do is to make sure that uh, they are they are able to sensitize their members of the public uh, to be able to uh, become more responsible. To uh, Parliamentarians have a very big role to play in most of parliament to make sure that they allocate resources to the Minister of Health, which it's it, to the Minister of Health to be able to deal with their, uh, their, their, their upcoming issues because of COVID. Uh, within the region, I know quite, member, quite, a, quite a number of members of parliament are very active to try to talk to their communities, to try to engage the, the public to try to engage the local communities at the lowest end. And I think the biggest lesson we have learned is that uh, members of parliament need to put more effort for domestic resources. Domestic resources is key for most of the uh, 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 diseases within the, uh, the, the, the world. Because at the end of the day, if the region the African region and members of parliament within the region, they don't push the governments of the day to make sure that they increase the allocation of health sector will still have serious challenges when epidemic comes like this. So my biggest advocacy and I, my, my calling all members of parliament within they allocate domestic resources. As the curve for the uh, uh, donor money goes down, the domestic resource should be increasing at a, at a steady curve to make sure that at least uh, the, the region is self-sustaining. Thank you. 
Thank you, sir. I mean, if there is one good thing that uh, we hope might come out of this crisis is that all countries will take health more seriously now, that they'll understand health is indeed wealth, that without a functioning effective healthcare system, you simply cannot uh, have the economy uh, in good shape. Um, and I think uh, Mr. Mule's comment, and also something that uh, Calypso has been talking more about, is um, a bad thing that might happen because of this crisis is that uh, many of the richest countries in the world have been devastated by COVID. And there is growing calls internally to cut back on foreign aid um, or development assistance. And it's already starting to happen. Uh, we just saw that, for example, the, the British parliament uh, approved uh, collapsing their international aid uh, DFID with their uh, foreign office. So, and we also saw US government cutting funding to WHO in the midst of a crisis. So if the rich countries start scaling back on their foreign aid, and if uh, uh, domestic resources do not go up, then we will have a substantial crisis in many countries in delivering even basic healthcare, let alone make progress to UHC by 2030. Uh, so Calypso, would you like to add a little bit of your thinking on the critical need for mobilizing domestic resources currently and then post pandemic as well. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you, Madhu, for this. And perhaps we could, I could also pass it back to you, honorable MPs, for one quick sentence at the end before, before we wrap up on precisely that point. But exactly as you said, Madhu, I think we're faced with a huge economic crisis and already our colleagues have highlighted their worries about the economy. I mean, ultimately COVID is a health crisis COVID is also an economic crisis, and certainly many countries around the world, especially um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia as well, uh, tasted, felt the consequences, the economic consequences of the policy response in wealthier countries in the North before they felt the uh, health impact of COVID. And indeed, in many countries still, uh, the health impact of COVID is not as great, perhaps, as the health consequences uh, of the economic recession that's going to be significant and lasting. And I think we're already seeing, for instance, a reduction in out-of-pocket spending for all the wrong reasons. We were discussing this with colleagues the other day in a similar panel, but how can we monitor and preempt some of these extremely negative consequences, especially in lower middle-income countries where out-of-pocket spending has been effectively uh, central especially for uh, diseases also other than infectious diseases. So we don't talk much about chronic conditions, for example, and yet uh, uh, poor people around the world spend out of pocket to access services, to buy medicines for their loved ones with diabetes, for hypertension. So that's also essential services that also matters. How can we monitor, how can we see what's going on, mitigate against uh, this uh, tragic prospect really at a time when deficit will be financing health, and that has significant consequences So, how much more money for health could be mobilized at a time when we'll have a massive uh, demand shock, income shock. Individuals, families will have much less money to spend on health, and that's why they'll be spending less, not because they don't need the services. And at the time, as you said, Radu, that the private sector in many settings perhaps is not behaving as responsibly or themselves are suffering because of the of the crisis. So maybe we could turn it back to each one of our honorable MPs and just ask them for a thought about the future, especially in relation to funds for health, financing for health. Um, where is this going and what are your, your thoughts about the future? Perhaps we could start with uh, uh, honorable Vincent Pala and then we'll move from, from there. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, at least uh, I do agree with you that COVID is uh, a health issues, a health crisis an economic crisis, but uh, as far as India, even a social crisis also. Because uh, once people know that uh, they are suffering from COVID, so that stigma is there that is difficult so for them even to, uh, to be treated. For example, a small symptom of cough uh, for TB, and that also is a problem. People will not, uh, will not be able to treat them. And definitely the private uh, at this time will be uh, uh, will be away from all this. So the entire expenditure, the entire treatment will be on the on the government. As far as uh, in India is concerned, and especially in the area where I live in my constituency, I think it's the first time we have seen that the uh, government, along with the uh, the community as a whole, 
uh, you know, with the villagers and uh, in urban areas, they, they'll come together. For example, every MP will spend one crore from the MP Lats fund, one crore in Indian rupees, I think in 145, uh, uh, I think thousand dollars in terms of US dollars, or every MP will, will donate at least uh, one lakh rupees uh, to the Prime Minister's fund to fund it. And at the same time, though we are in a crisis, uh, the government of India has introduced uh, cest in uh, many of the uh, many of the uh, products. For example, even like petroleum products, they are supposed to pass the benefit because the crude price has come down. But they are supposed to pass the the benefits to the public. But again, the government has increases as part of the funding. So even at the central government, India is a huge country. Definitely, we are a poor country. Almost uh, 68 to 70 percent of our people are. Uh, you know, are, uh, are poor people. So that is a concern, funding is a concern. We don't need the help of people. But at the same time, I am very sure that uh, 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 though uh, COVID is uh, so far is intreatable, but I'm very sure we are very confident that in a month or two, maybe we'll get the medicines with that hope. Otherwise, uh, we'll be, uh, you know, it will be a concern for the funding. I do agree with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Pala. Just to add that uh, if there is one country that really, really needs to increase its investment in health, that is India. As you know, 1.5% of the GDP is spent on health. At least if we can reach up to 2.5% of the GDP spent on health, that would be like the bare minimum India needs to do uh, post-COVID crisis. So your advocacy along those lines to put health as an important agenda on Indian politics would be quite critical, I would think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you are right. Actually, you know, that's why when the parliamentarians on health has been uh, formed, we did increase, especially for tuberculosis, we did increase the budget. Today, if you see India as a whole, we have the central funding and the state funding. If you combine both state funding and central funding together, the latest research we have, I've seen is almost 4%, maybe uh, around 4% combined state and central. So in terms of funding, we are very much low compared to the rest of the world. I do agree with you, but we are putting our efforts. We are used to meet as the group of parliamentarians on health. We do meet the ministers, the prime ministers. We give and insist them that we should increase it and cut the other expenditure, but increase the budget. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Wonderful. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. If there's one message perhaps from today, it is more money for health is important. If I may pass over to Honorable Gisela Scaglia, please. What are your thoughts about financing for health? You raised concerns about the economy, obviously. Yes, I totally agree with you. Um, and uh, I think that uh, in Argentina, we have to work to, to sustain and elevate primary health care because this is the key foundation of universal health coverage. And um, people must have access to health services near their homes. Uh, but as you know, Argentina have a big territory and the possibilities and difficulties are not the same in different provinces. Uh, we have a mixed system and complex healthcare system with province, national level, and mix and public uh, uh, private sector involved. So it's a, a mixed system of healthcare. Uh, we have the national budget, but then we have the province or federal budgets in our province. And there are very difference between our province. But um, this um, this is uh, so important now to keep investing in the first level care uh, because COVID-19 show us this gap between province and cities uh, and cities and the national level. So we have to invest in this uh, primary health care system and improve proximity in the health services around the country. And last but uh, not least, I'm working because I think that it's a, a, a good law uh, in a project of mobile health. We don't have uh, this kind of medicine here in Argentina. We don't have law to, to, to work in mobile health. 
And I think that we have to use the existing technology to improve our healthcare systems because it's a way to 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 be near the people and to to have uh, the opportunity to treat another diseases, not only the infection diseases, as you said. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And I see people have to leave, so let me thank you all for taking the time. Thank you to the Global Fund for co-organizing this with us and to Professor Pai for kindly working with us to scope this out and also to deliver it on the day today. And to the team, the CGT team, Julia Kaufman and the colleagues from communications for their hard work. And thank you all for participating and especially our MPs for taking time. And uh, uh, please continue your hard work. A lot hinges on it. Um, and this advocacy for more money for health at this difficult time, I think is so important and really translates in life saved now and in the future. Thank you and take care, stay safe. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you, thank you, nice to meet you. Nice.